it's a really great pleasure to welcome uh, Neil Lindgren from uh, from Media, Film and Journalism, we should get that right, who are our very close neighbours and we'd love to have more interaction with, with journalism uh, here. I think that's going to be possible, um, particularly after the brief conversation we've just had already. Um, so thank you so much, Mia, for taking the time to speak to us and we're really interested to hear what you've got to say about headphone intimacy and... Uh, for those of you, I mean, I guess everyone knows about his background, but it is it is in journalism and particularly in radio production and sound. So um, that's something that's obviously very of, of great interest to us here too. Um, so we're really looking forward to what you've got to say and the discussion that follows. Thank you. So thank you very much for coming. And uh, when I walked in here, I freaked out thinking this is a very large uh, screen for a topic about radio and podcasting but it doesn't look too bad but I know I'm old tech in an old kind of PowerPoint style but there will be some audio to make it more interesting. So I was absolutely stoked to be invited um, and a, a lot of my recent work has been uh, trying to look at changing uh, genres and formats in podcasting which is really building on uh, a lot of the understanding of the power of radio, the power of sound, the power of voices, but how they're actually translating and transforming in the podcast environment. Personal stories really uh, permeate the contemporary media landscape with first-person writing described by uh, a journalism scholar named uh, Rosalind Coward as perhaps quote, the biggest growth area of journalism. So these personal stories we find pretty much everywhere. And the word storytelling is popping up a lot. So in journalism, we're starting to think about, well, what are the boundaries around that? Obviously, all journalism is storytelling, but is all storytelling journalism? Well, probably not, because it's used by a whole range of other disciplines. Uh, so this talk will... Uh, argue that the movement towards this first-person narrative in podcasting is intrinsically linked with the intimate nature of the audio medium. And of course this strength has been known to people like myself uh, for a very long time, but it's really kind of entered the mainstream through podcasting when people are going, oh, this is a really useful format for hearing and understanding the world. So I'll play some audio examples. Uh, some of you uh, might have heard parts of what I'll talk about uh, in a different context, um, but hopefully there's some new interesting work for you. So um, I wanted to start by talking about listening, changing listening practices, because uh, as my title indicates, the fact that people are listening more and more in headphones really is starting to impact on the way that the stories are told. Uh, we'll look at some examples of this emerging podcast genres in this intimate and personal storytelling style, and I'll uh, have a couple of examples. Um, so the two examples, one of them is from the US, and there's reasons why I've chosen an American uh, example, because that's really where podcasting has been kind of exploded from. And we notice it with uh, students, especially uh, programs like This American Life, Radio Lab. Everyone wants to make stories in that style. The other example is a uh, podcast produced here at Monash University about women and work. So uh, called Are We There Yet? And I can tell you the answer is no. <laughs> Not in our lifetime is the answer, unfortunately. And uh, I thought it would be an interesting example partly because it's got some focus groups, it's got some data uh, and, and analysis, but also because uh, the presenters are complete amateurs. They're experts in their field, but they're amateurs as podcasters. So, you know, it brings out some other uh, kind of interesting as aspects of that. But let's just go back right <laughs> to the start. And the reason why I'm showing you is because of the... I want to talk about podcasting and the radiogenic background. And this is where radio used to happen in this way. And note how they're listening in headphones. So the crystal set always came with headphones. 
They're sitting around, so it's a communal setting, albeit an individual listening practice. And I'm also showing this because I love showing old photos. Here's another one. And this is another example of forms of listening practices. So as you see, the broadcast here is being transmitted through the speaker on the car and everyone's crowding around to hear. So this is a kind of communal experience of listening to uh, the radio. Another one, and again there's reasons for showing you this. The one on the left, this is clearly a happening. They're sitting down at a certain time of the day listening to a certain program broadcast there and then in this linear form of radio. And look at that concentration. I mean, they're all staring at the receiver, completely immersed in the content. And if you compare that with the uh, English 1942 version, you can tell that knitting and smoking a pipe <laughs> are perfect accompanying listening to the radio. There is one issue there, though, and that's the woman who's reading the paper. And that, to me, illustrates one of the challenges that's always been uh, an issue for radio producers like myself. We've always known that it's a secondary medium. People are doing other things as they're listening to the program. She's reading the paper. She's not likely to be focused on what she's hearing. She's dipping in and out of the story as she's, li as she's reading. So what that really meant was that it developed a flow radio where people would dip, dip in and out. So the morning programs would be targeted at a spe special audience, the midday uh, daytime programming would be targeted towards women and children and other people who might be at home. But it's always a distracted listening. It's just, so it means that in terms of production, you're constantly reminding people, you're listening to this and this, and, so you know that you might get them to listen to parts of it, but it's not the full story. I'll go through this, so just another few, because I think these are really useful examples of reminding us how we have listened before. So here we've got the radio located centrally in the kitchen. Now, obviously, I reckon this room would have been full of noise and people doing stuff. So. You can imagine the radios happening in the background, they might pick up certain things, although in this image it looks like they're actually really focusing. But I think that's because it's an ad for the American uh, Corporation, sorry, Radio Corporation of America. But what this also indicates is this secondary medium where you're listening to radio whilst going about your daily life. It's a companion or a friend as uh, the radio scholar Jo Tacky, uh, who uh, used to be at RMIT, she did a really great study, uh, an, an anthropological study, of how people listen to radio. And being a friend was one of the things that she found. Uh, in this ad, if I can just, if you let me indulge just for a second, what, what the chairman of the radio corporation actually tries to sell radio as, he says, quote, radio by its very nature is a medium of mass communication. It's a carrier of intelligence. It delivers ideas with an impact that is powerful. Its essence is freedom, liberty of thought <laughs> and of speech. Well, the context is, of course, it's within in, a, in a, an American setting. But, you know, I quite like some of those words in terms of the carrier of intelligence. It delivers ideas with an impact that is powerful. So we've got the idea of kind of intellectual ideas, but then the powerful bit is the emotional impact. And that's really what we're seeing driving this change. And finally, we're up to a kind of semi-modern. So most of, or a lot of uh, listening happens in the car. And traditionally, the car has been the place where people have learned to listen to the radio. And it's an interesting listening practice. Again, I'm talking about this as a kind of hybrid model. You're doing something else, you're driving, but if you're on your own, you're actually in a bit of a bubble. So you're, it's an intimate, personal experience, and yet a kind of public space. 
So it's a bubble where radio is freely available in cars, it can be listened to as a form of background entertainment, and yet it can be a focused experience. So in the US, and most of the data comes from the US, there's very little from Australia, 93% of all US adult listening to radio weekly, sorry, 93% of US adults listen to radio weekly, according to a Nielsen research in 2016. Half of them listen in the car. So radio's not dead in any way, it's just that podcasting is driving something new. So that's an important point to make because, you know, as we're trying to think about what happens with media into the future, radio is probably the medium that's going the best in the sense that it's very stable and very strong in terms of numbers. According to Pew Research Centre, they looked at traditional AM, FM radio and they said it continues to reach an overwhelming majority of the American public. Audio as a platform is stronger than ever as more and more ways to listen continue to emerge. So that's their assessment of it. And if my own behaviour is any interest to this audience, I reckon it's only been in the last six months that I've gone from listening to the radio to listening to podcasts. And this is a significant shift for someone who has radios in every room on her, in her house. And I just listen to radio all the time. Now I hop in, I plug it in, Bluetooth it, and I listen to podcasts which of course is completely shifting the content that I'm getting. I'm no longer getting my accidental listening. The programs that surprise me, I go for the ones I like. So I do a daily batch of the BBC's Woman's Hour, which is a really long-standing, fantastic program. And I do some Swedish pods, so I know what's happening in Sweden, and I get a fix of Swedish. But I'm losing out on all that other content that I used to get. And you can really see that I am not alone in making that move from terrestrial listening to online podcasting. So I only really wanted to show you this again. It's from the States. So you can see the smartphone ownership going up and the online radio listening going up to follow. Again, going back to Edison Research, 57% of US adults listen to online radio in the past month. They're making uh, some observations that the number of radio sets in the household is going down in the States. 2008, 96% of adults had a radio at home. Today, only 79%. So it's really, you know, shifting. And at the same time, more than one in five Australia, sorry, one in five Americans have listened to a podcast in the last month. So that's really shifting. So. I'll move away from this context, but I just wanted to really paint the picture of where we've come from, where kind of radio is sitting, uh, what's happening in terms of the technology, uh, so that we can start talking about some of the content. There is some uh, data from Australia, but as I said, very limited. There's predictions of a podcast penetration to be one in two in Australia, in Australia so that's nine and a half million. Um, yeah, so some of this data really just talks about the fact that what podcasts um, as, a, as a platform has done, it shares a lot of similarities with radio, but there are two main differences. One is the time shifting. Like all other media, you can access it whenever you want. It can be two minutes or it can be 52 minutes or it can be a three hour podcast. It depends on what you want. You're no longer constrained by broadcast schedules or um, uh, target audiences or anything like that. So that's really freed it up. And the other one is the audience engagement. Unlike radio production where formats have always been attracted, uh, uh, formats have been tailored to attract broad audiences to bring in as many and for commercial environments as much money as possible. What podcasts are doing is that they're looking at a very niche audience and that's driving the, the commitment and the interest and the ability for people who become really passionate about their show and their willingness to support financially <coughs> these productions is really changing the way that you can be much more targeted. So this is where we're up to now. With smartphones, we predominantly listen, listen in headphones, creating what uh, radio scholar Richard Berry talks, uh, describes as a personal and highly privatised space. 
So remember that image in the beginning of the crystal set. You know, that's what they were doing. So we're kind of going back, in a sense, to that individual listening experience, which radio always was in the sense that I was trained to always ever address one person. You hoped that you had thousands of listeners, or even a million if you were lucky, but as a producer, you're trained to do one. You speak to one individual person. Mass medium, but an individual. Now, this is truly what we're doing. We're speaking to one person. And what it means is that it's, it's kind of moved, in my <coughs> mind, a secondary medium into a primary medium. We're no longer distracted by other things. We might be walking around doing things, but we are focused. And it's put the story at the centre of the content. The quality of the audio, the narrative, it's all back right at the centre. Listening is focused, it's chosen by the listeners, they're committed to it because they're interested and they don't get any of that accidental uh, listening which you know I think is sad because there's lots of really good accidental listening out there. Uh, and, and some of the work that I've done previously shows that people are starting to re-listen to shows, which is also completely unheard of. I mean, the YouTube generation know that you might go back and watch the same YouTube clip a lot of times, which is why, Mark, uh, which is why commercial ads actually work in YouTube, because you'll get the viewing. Now, that doesn't work in radio usually. No one's ever gone back to listen to a story again. We're starting to find that. The quality of the work is increasing because people think it's worth putting that time in because people, you know, the listeners are going to listen in high quality headphones. So all of a sudden we're talking stereo sound. None of this mono sound that we had in AM radio, which has been the talk radio place in Australia. So it's really uh, opening up opportunities for very high quality productions. And it's foregrounding headphones and and the fact that it is no longer a background uh, medium. So this is starting to impact on the content as is really the main argument of my talk. And there's growing uh, research around podcast audiences and formats, but we actually still know very little about it. So there's a lot of work that can be done around the forms and the way that people consume podcasts. Ooh. That was interesting. <laughs> Sort of oh, here we go. I clearly stayed too long on that slide. I just wanted to say that there's a number of studies uh, looking at how people access, uh, engage with uh, music through headphones. Mostly, you know, going back to Walkman and I, uh, iPods, etc. And really, what, if I can summarise, what a lot of those studies come up with is that they documenting the solitary and individualistic listening experience. People actually want to be closing off against others. And there's one study that I thought I'd mention to you guys especially. There's a, da there's a Norwegian um, journalism scholar named Lars Nure and his colleagues in Bergen. And they've done a lot of mapping now of content where they've put headphones on and they call it pedestrian, um, pedest p pedestrian listening. So they had three lots of um, guinea pigs moving through the tube in London, listening to music, one group, one group to educational podcasts, and the other one was a news program from the BBC. And they concluded that actually, when it's really busy around and people have to concentrate, it was the music that people chose. The other things were too distracted, distracting. So again, that kind of, I guess in my mind, gives some weight to the fact that your, the podcasting, is an intentional listening and best done in that way. Possibly not when you have to navigate the tube in London. Okay, so I'm just going to move into the next part, which is really around story, personal storytelling. And this is an interest of mine, and I've covered it in a number of kind of uh, presentations and publications. So what does this mean for podcast storytelling and audio journalism? And, and this is where it really links with the growth of personal and confessional stories. So this academic, Rosalind Coward, uh, who herself is a journalist working for The Guardian, 
<coughs> did a study looking at print and she noted this growth in the field of personal stories. And these tend to be social issues covered in a personal way. So it's moving away from what we might consider kind of classic journalism. Finance, war, conflict, the serious stuff in a sense. And they deal with these softer inner emotions of humanity. So it's the idea that we can watch others, we can learn from seeing what others are doing. And this is really talking to the way that headphones allow you to listen like that and you can choose the stories that you want to listen to. So, so this change in audio, and again it's really not documented at all, there's just been a couple of things written about it so far. It's of course links to the, to the disruption of media, you know, anyone can be a media producer. Technology, I was saying before, you saw the smartphone increase usage. Um, one interesting thing that coincided with the podcast boom was that the podcast app on the iPhone 6 was the first one that you couldn't delete. So all of a sudden that app actually made it possible to access uh, podcast content in a, way, in a way that just wasn't done before. And a lot of these stories might actually appear trivial and domestic, emphasising, as I said, this inner emotional life, the opposite of subjects considered proper journalism. But it links with the power of the sound and the power of the voices and the emotional responses we have to sharing other people's lives and stories. Uh, according to US radio producer Jay Allison, he wrote that this is where the human voice can sneak in, bypass the brain and touch the heart. And that's a really good example of what podcasting and audio storytelling can do. So we kind of have a perfect situation for an evolution which started with this. Now, have you listened to the serial? Yes. Yep. Yep. What do you think? Loved it. Loved it. Do you know how many times it's been downloaded? More than a million. More than a million? Try a bit more. Seven. Seven? A bit more. Wow. 100 million wow. times. It is extraordinary. Nothing else has been done in that way. They were aiming for, I'm just going to play a little bit. They were aiming for, you know, a few hundred thousand, if they were really lucky, a hundred million. So this is just a, 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 a short part from the 12th episode. Oh, no, no, come back. The uselessness of what we're trying to do That's not by working. removing something that doesn't fit. So it, it's like that trying didn't to didn't sound like that last time. The coordinates of someone's dream or something. You know, I have no meditation loops like, and it is what it is. If someone believes me or not, you know, I have no control over it. What's happening? AV's gone to sleep. The AV's gone to sleep. I'll take that personally. <laughs> <laughs> That's really rude, your AV. <laughs> <laughs> I have to apologise for AV. Yes, I think you have to. <laughs> First, I didn't, I stayed too long on the slide, and now. Should, Should I try again? The uselessness oh. of what we're trying to do by recreating something that doesn't fit. It's, it's like trying to plot the coordinates of someone's dream or something. You know, I've never been able to explain it. And it is what it is. If someone believes me or not, you know, I have no control over it. This is a global family that they call from. A non sadist. And in data. A Maryland Correctional Facility. It's called From This American Life and WBEZ Chicago, it's Serial, one story told week by week. And this, episode 12, is the final week, final episode of season one of this podcast. It's been a year since I first contacted Adnan, and I'm still talking to him regularly. I'm still asking him the basics. Still thinking, I don't know, that he'll remember something or maybe he'll just get so frustrated with me that he'll crack. I still want to know what you were doing that afternoon. I want to know who had your phone and I want to know what you were doing that afternoon. You no, know, I, don't, I don't remember anything more. 
This is from Saturday night, just this past Saturday. I mean, we're down to the wire here. Oh, man. So you don't really have to kill my man. You don't really have no ending. Like, it's just... I mean, <laughs> do I have an ending? <laughs> of course I have an ending. We're going to come to an ending today. Plus, a smattering of new information, a review of old information. So, the serial told in 12 episodes uh, was a real life crime, uh, unsolved. Well, no, I'll take that back because clearly one person was convicted for this murder <laughs> of his high school girlfriend in Baltimore in 1999. And what you just heard is a very new form of audio journalism. You've got a reporter, a presenter, Sarah Koenig, who is sharing her doubts in public as part of that. She's saying, oh, I just, you know, I'm still <coughs> ringing you, I just want you to tell me. All those things that we used to do as journalists behind the scene, but you would never actually share it with the audience. And this is what people loved, the authenticity that this creates the transparency in the production of journalism. And it makes her real, it makes her a friend, it makes her someone I might have a conversation with. It creates a connection that we just haven't seen before. So it was really this podcast that instigated an international conversation about the personal approach to storytelling that became Sarah Koenig's signature style and that you heard this example of. And on one hand, Koenig was widely criticised for presenting a deeply personal story about life and death, and, and a very tragical one. One person was dead, you know, there were, the impact on the, the, on the families, one person was in jail. As fiction, mimicking the kinds of drama that we might be binge-watching on Netflix or an HBO production. On the other hand, this style really fostered a greater understanding of the journalistic process and encouraged a growing literacy around the making of radio and podcasts. And it's created an expectation of style that really encompasses this transparency of the production, of the creating, creation of the journalistic piece. And also the power of the, the authentic content that the producers can engage with. And it's called a kind of meta-narrative style. She's constantly talking directly to the listeners. She's being very self-deprecating. She's often questioning herself. And it's actually really difficult not to like her. So there's that emotional response to her. And even more difficult to like the guy in jail convicted of the murder, because he's very clever and interesting. And you know, you just think, oh, I'd like to be his friend. Mm. Ethically very uh, challenging. So um, this is now really spread, and more recently, these are two Australian examples where newspapers are kind of finally, in my mind, understanding the power of the voices. So the first one is a series that The Australian has done, and it's got a lot of attention. It's a unsolved murder uh, case in New South Wales, and it's produced as an episode. So we've got a newspaper journo who knows nothing about producing a, uh, a podcast who has pretty much used the template of the serial. Very successful. He's going to win awards. It's very compelling listening. And then The Age, only on Monday this week, have they released their first podcast. So their investigative team has teamed up with some audio producers to come up with this content because they're understanding that this is a diverse way of actually engaging with audiences completely differently. So I find, you know, watch this space in terms of what this development is, is doing. And in addition to these two, the New York Times announced in March this year that they were creating a podcast team, public radio broadcaster N, uh, WNYC, announced that they were, they were raising $15 million for a podcast division. Wall Street Journal has got a podcast division. You know, so it's really showing, I think, the power of it. 
So I'm just going to talk a little bit about the, the kind of styles that we're getting at the moment. So the fact that there are no boundaries as to how long or the style or, or anything, there's a lot of creative experimentation with, this, with the genre. There's everything from this low cost chum cast sitting in the basement, <laughs> having a little chat, very popular in certain areas. There's this much more highly developed uh, personal narrative, personal storytelling that we've seen through a lot of the work. Um, and this idea that you can actually help listeners understand their own life by the narration of others. Through the narration of others' experiences, we can understand ourselves. And the other thing the serial really identified is that, the, that listeners, surprisingly, have this capacity for very complex information that we previously thought they just wouldn't do. They couldn't deal with, we've learnt in radio, don't talk about numbers, it's too complex. You can only do that visually. But actually, they wanted 12 episodes of about 40 minutes each. Every single detail of this murder. So, I, as I started off saying in the beginning, radio people have always known about this strength. And really good producers have always worked with these techniques to create connection. But I just felt that these two quotes were really good in highlighting this link between intimacy of radio, which has been supercharged by podcast formats and headphone listening. So really, this is a perfect place to explore these inner lives. When you think about stories produced for screen, emotions have to be played out for us to see them. Whereas here, we can hear them. And of course, what radio does as well is it creates these images in the mind of people, which is very powerful. So it's a very good and very fertile ground for experimentation. Hilary Frank, who, became, who called herself an accidental podcaster, writes about her first podcast, and you can see the quote herself. She just couldn't quite believe how much it was whispering into the ear. And Jonah uh, Weiner writes about podcasts, and he says this. He says... It's, he's, we talk about the form as a, quote, uh, the form's special sense of intimacy and even its erotics, he says. He suggests that many podcasts are listened to in transit and are therefore <coughs> akin to books found at airports and train stations. And that does say something about it. Uh, there's some other work that um, Robert McDougall has done that really highlights this incredible link between personal and professional life in terms of podcast. And he talks about the podcast being the latest manifestation of the turning away from the visual analytical mode to what McLuhan, nice to go back inside him, called the tactile embrace of the oral oral. McDougall argues that the podcast, and particularly podcast listened to on the move in headphones, may be part of an evolution of parasocial phenomena and a fundamentally new form of mediated interpersonal communication. Pretty interesting ideas. With the headphones in place, listeners hear someone or several people speaking quite literally between their ears, adding a certain reality to the phrase getting in someone's head. Extending far beyond the way readers of a novel might report sympathy for or may empathise or identify with various characters, Certainly one rarely talks back to, let alone find oneself yelling at a page of printed words. So it really follows on to some kind of movement that's been happening coming out of National Public Radio in the States, where Ira Glass, who's an absolute superstar and has had sold out presentations in Australia, where he's been saying that journalists need to start to sound like human beings. They need to really focus on the stories, use the techniques from fiction <coughs> and imply that, uh, employ that in non-fiction. So I think it's not surprising that we're starting to see some of this work coming out of particularly from the States. So I'll play you just a quick uh, little bit from Planet Money. Has anyone heard this? Yes. Yep. This is a great episode. It actually is a kind of meta meta episode where they're actually talking about whether or not narrative is the best style to do radio and they're testing it and I'll, and, and I love the way they talk about their, their program because I don't know that I would go there necessarily 
but I love it. You know, I'll just planet money. You know, I'm not so interested in money. But this, meet me at the bar and tell me what's going on with the uh, economy. Now imagine that's actually a fun evening. That's what we do. <laughs> so I'm just going to play you a bit. It's edited, so it's, uh, it's shortened. Back in 2007, when Barack Obama was running for president, he stopped by Google headquarters. And it's sort of a joke they asked him one of Google's notoriously tough interview questions. What is the most efficient way to sort a million 32-bit integers? <laughs> Obama might have been fed the answer. Well, uh, I'm, I'm, maybe, I, I, I'm sorry, maybe. No, 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 no. I, 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 I think, I, I, I think, uh, I think the, uh, the bubble sort would be the wrong way to go. <laughs> Obama talked about using big data to make government better. Dan Soroker, this engineer sitting in the back of the audience, was smitten. For Dan, Obama's spiel was powerful stuff. And I remember the last thing he said when he came to Google was, I want you to be involved. And uh, I took him literally. Uh, two weeks later, I flew to Chicago uh, in the dead of winter, joined the campaign as a volunteer. Dan knew nothing about campaigns, but he did know computers, and he saw this problem with Obama's website. There was a little button that said, sign up for email at the bottom, but most people didn't click. So he says, hey, what if we could improve this bottleneck, this percentage of people who sign up on our email list? So I ran an experiment on the BarackObama.com splash page he created two versions of this website's page, version A and version B. Hello and welcome to Planet Money. I'm Steve Penn. And I'm Robert Smith. A-B tests like the one that Dan did, A-B tests are everywhere these days. Major websites, in stores, in classrooms. Everyone's trying to figure out what you'd like better, version A or version B. In fact, this very podcast that you're listening to right now, this podcast was A-B tested. Today on the show, we give people what they want, or we think they want. Journalism by the numbers. And Robert, you know what? That, that phrase, hello and welcome to Planet Money, it doesn't test well with the audience. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so this is going to get a little bit meta here, but, but stick with me. The way this podcast started, you know, the little story about Barack Obama. I, I, I think, uh, I think the, uh, the bubble sort would be the wrong way to go. <laughs> that was not the only way we came up with to start this podcast. In fact, we played two different introductions to this podcast to 42,000 unsuspecting listeners, and we watched them very carefully to see which introduction worked better. So I want you to imagine that this podcast is starting all over again. Clear your mind, pretend like you just heard some stamps.com ad, and you're about to start the Planet Money podcast with version B. Since modern companies were created more than 100 years ago, most have been organized as these hierarchies. You get hired as a young kid straight from school, and you have a boss. Chances are your boss has a boss. And if you come up with some new idea and someone up this chain of... So, I'm not, I, I don't think we need to comment on that because I think it actually speaks for itself. It's a really good episode in testing the idea of the stories, the storytelling, versus what we might think of is the more traditional way of presenting journalism. The other one I wanted to show you was this Are We There Yet uh, podcast. So this is recorded up in our studio up in Building B. And it's an evidence-based storytelling podcast about women and work. And this was the pilot episode uh, called Good Girl Syndrome. I'm just going to play a tiny bit in the beginning so you can get a sense of it. Equal pay <laughs> and childcare and parental leave and opportunities for promotion and representation. Women are paid less, women are promoted less. Misogyny, sexy. I want to know why I worry about my daughter more, but I know she's going to have to work harder and be better and probably be paid less than my son. Hello and welcome to Are We There Yet? A podcast about women and work. I'm Linda Vince and I'm Barbara Dalton. And on this show, we'll talk about how being a woman still impacts on our work. Our so amateur presenters, but experts in their field. And what they wanted to create was a place where you could have reflection and personal storytelling and sharing, which they do in their training, and they wanted to see if that worked in terms of 
uh, the podcast. So these are just some of the quotes that came back from the focus groups that we did afterwards, which hasn't been uh, presented yet. But really what it said was the value of the stories and the hearing, but, but mixed with this evidence base, because do, doing just stories is actually not going to be enough. You can't just build a whole life based on what, per, what people uh, share as their personal experience. But what it did say was that it, it created this space for reflection which is exactly what we wanted as part of this production. It's a research project that you know, we've been working on for a while and continue to produce these podcasts, which is a lot of fun. Um, but it was actually looking at whether this could be an alternative to what they were doing in real life. And, and having these quotes coming back around reflection, getting people to think about it, really resonates with uh, a lot of the work that's been done around the benefits of it. So I'm going to stop and I'm just going to kind of summarise and we've talked about a number of these things but what I wanted just to come to the very last point there which is the softening of journalism. It really draws on uh, these two examples, draws on this idea that Ira Glass said we have to start talking to people in a different way, putting the human experience as a centrepiece of the programmes. And having the presenters actually part of it, having the journalists actually part of it and this is something that I've written about in previous papers. And, and as I said, Sarah Koenig, it was one of the successes, uh, one of the things that were, were noted as, as, as the reason for the success of the serial. And this is also a new emerging uh, research agenda, in, engaging with issues in journalism such as emotions, emotionality, affect, human interest, subjectivity, personality, public-private boundaries, work, service, culture, lifestyle, etc., etc., um, which really engages with these softer aspects of journalism. So this is a, quite a, an interesting path for journalism studies in the digital media landscape. So I just wanted to kind of leave it there. So thank you. So thank you so much. I mean, we've got time for questions. If people have questions that they'd like to ask or discussion, they'd like to talk about anyone. It's a good thing, Paul. Well, um, uh, Mia, thank you for a terrific talk. Um, I'm so interested in this topic. Um, th there was a slide there you had, it was one of the last ones where um, one of the quotes coming out of the Are We There Yet um, podcast, where it, it, the idea of you know these personal stories dispelling the myth. I think it actually creates another kind of myth about that you're getting something really authentic and real and somehow, so it's sort of, it's, it's dispelling one set of myths and then mm. kind of igniting an, another myth. And I, I wondered if you could talk to that a bit, just in terms of, you know, if journalism is, like there's this shift in journalism towards personal storytelling, what, what are we losing? Mm. What kind of myths are we creating for ourselves at the same time? And I guess that's why I like the, the kind of tag word that we've put on this podcast which is evidence-based storytelling. Mm. I just don't believe that we can just do storytelling. I think there has to be some ability for us to also have evidence to understand these personal experiences in. Mm. So it's a bit like, you know, um, Deb who's, a, who's an oral historian, you know, in oral history you're trained, you might collect a whole range of interviews with people about their experiences, but you don't just put up one. You, the themes are created by looking at all these stories together. So if you think about the Nauru uh, files that The Guardian presented, which was these incredibly compelling 2,000 reports from Nauru, and the way that they were put up as big data, you know, placeholders, 2,000 placeholders, you could click on either of them and get the personal stories of what was happening. Now, one story, we've heard one story before, but we've never heard 2,000 stories mm. that you could move between. Mm. So that's, the, for me, the beauty of kind of being in this space where it's about the capacity for big how I would, uh, would answer that question or, you know, the comment. I was just trying to look up some of the numbers for Serial because I hadn't realised how much it had jumped um, and I, can't, I must admit I can't uh, sort of tie them down at the moment. But I do know that I got really caught up in Serial 1 right from the start 
and then I listened to Serial 2, and I, I wasn't going to invest. I don't know what it was. <laughs> There's something about her voice in the first one, a different voice in the second one, different set of stories. I just never, you know, I realized I had binge listened the mm. first time. I really did. Like, I yeah. think I listened for the whole thing in two days or something. But then mm. I do that with Netflix sometimes, too. So. <laughs> <laughs> but with, um, yeah, with Serial 2, I just, yeah. Don't, don't you else. think it's the topic? So the serial two, the no. second season, was about a very well-known, although I had not paid attention, so, uh, of an American soldier who had uh, been interned in Afghanistan mm. and had actually, sorry, had fled his own uh, battalion and got caught by the Taliban and spent five years in Taliban prison and was then exchanged back to the US and he was of course seen as a traitor and he's gone through a lot of court cases. I only listened to about four and I, I just couldn't do it. So for me that's about the topic and it's no surprise that the two Australian months that I showed were both crime mm. stories. Mm. The serial is a crime story and guess what is the most popular podcast genre on, on iTunes or anywhere else? True crime. Then, then sport, so in that order. So was it a, was it a question of helping to solve it? That yeah. Like we were all trying to solve it. We're all trying to solve the, it. The and you know, Reddit, Reddit, well, Reddit was going one. crazy yeah. in trying to solve it with her. Yeah. The first one was so. playing out in, I said, well, you know, it's a historical uh, case, but it was playing out in approximate real time yeah. with Sarah to and throwing yeah. and the story evolving. And then that second one was a series of interviews that a Hollywood producer had done mm. with somebody that had just been handed over en masse to the serial team to just kind of dig through and create a story. So it's so mm. after the fact, with without Sarah's direct involvement, without those telephone conversations, so if you do a compare and contrast mm. of intimacy, mm. yeah. for example, the differences of how those stories, those long form stories were made is totally different. And I think yeah. that's... I think they're both compelling stories. I just, I think, and I don't think it's a. I mean, true crime is always a mm. like a blockbuster genre. So mm. <coughs> yeah, I listen to all but of the second one. To, yeah, I listen to all yeah. of it, but I think there's big differences in in that engagement. Is it's just it's somebody kind of reporting on something that's already happened mm. and you interviews that have already mm. been taken place yeah. a long time ago by somebody else, not even the producer. Yeah. Yeah. And the audio quality is really poor. Skype. That's yeah. because their interviews, they were never intended for broadcast or publication. Mm. They were research interviews and that just, in the end, phone yep, really poor. Yeah. Too, as, as, yeah, so I was listening in headphones Skype. and I was going, no, I can't be bothered, This the quality is not good enough. I've got to think about this because I was listening to it, you talked about the intimacy. And I, mean, I, I, I agree, I agree the radio is the most intimate one, it's close to the head. There's a feeling of vibration, there's an importance of the medium like that, etc. And plus it closes off the world to some degree. So I kind of agree with all those things. I just got this kind of thing about, I find there's actually what you can call the opposite effect, the intrusion of intimacy in the idea of a lot of kind of radio um, journalism now as well. So I feel like a lot of people realise that it is an intimate medium and therefore they're playing up the very act of it being intimate. Yeah. And there's a point when I'm starting to turn off to lots of these things. Those storytelling ones seem to work in the long form and you listen to one voice and that one voice succeeds to another event through another voice. When you have two voices on, the whole thing starts to change fundamentally. Because intimacy, when you have two people speaking, is normally about the intrusion in dialogue. When you listen to a radio, a new voice popping in is actually something coming from outside. It breaks and it's abrupt. And it's really hard. When we chat, we, we know somebody's going to say something else. You look up, they're going to say something back. You're ready, you're prepared for the cue. But there's all these things going on over there, like people like Frank Kelly. I can't listen to Frank Kelly anymore because she's always trying to say how much interpolate I should be involved in her, listening to her. And she's always jumping in as well to say she's got something to say. And she's almost caught up this idea that she's the one speaking to everyone. We must be hearing what she says. I think there's actually a bit of a balance between the drive for knowledge, and a lot of people listen to podcasts because they want to pick up knowledge as they do other things, and the drive for intimacy, which is now being pushed in the journalistic framework. I don't know if that's a way of... I just think there's, there's, there's a point where the medium exceeds its own boundaries in terms of what it can do in terms of intimacy, and then it starts to become irritating, and maybe in some people it's doing that. I don't know, that's mm. just me, or it could be a structural problem as well. Well, I've just listened to the whole... Uh 
Barrowville uh, series. And I, uh, you know, it's very good in investigative journalism, but it got me a bit bored because it became predictable, uh, mostly because it's very similar to the serial. So I think it's in incredibly interesting to see how they've taken the podcast as a way of telling the story over time, and it really works. And I think Dan Box, the producer, the journalist, has done a fantastic job. So my only concern or criticism is that I think it's got the serial template. And I actually think we can do other things. And this is my concern that everyone's been so taken by This American Life, Radio Lab, Invisibilia, you know, Gim all the Gimlet productions, that we're all starting to try to sound like that. And a lot of Australians don't sound like the Americans. That's the other thing. It's about the, 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 the kind of the national way that we speak. Um, so, you know, you can kind of extrapolate it and say, will this mean that we won't really have any local content? Is it all just going to be American podcasts across the whole world? I think that would be very sad, and I don't think we're going to go that far. But there is something about this testing boundaries around, okay, how much in intimacy can we put into the story? Because that's what people like. Mm. Is, is there much, what about in Australia, is it? Is there were there any podcasts that were kind of breaking boundaries and testing things out that maybe are not well known because everybody's listening to these American productions? Yeah. There's not a huge amount. Uh, and, and, well, I can answer it in two ways. There's obviously the ABC ones, and there's now an ABC podcast division where they're starting to do separate content. So there's some really interesting uh, uh, work coming out of that one. And then there's a small independent group of podcasters and then there's the community radio so there's really those three mm -hmm. and I would say most of the innovation has actually been in community radio that's where a lot of and all the best in Sydney have done a fantastic job in training young people helping them put their podcast together but because the American style is so dominant mm -hmm. people kind of because it's been so exciting mm -hmm. and obviously 100 million people can't be wrong <laughs> so uh, yeah, it's, it's difficult to find that typical Australian style, whatever that is. And the other thing, I think, you know, I didn't grow up in Australia, so I don't have this sense, but I know a lot, of, a lot of the students, when I talk to them, they say that because crime is so popular, that they think that the American accent really adds to that crime <laughs> should be told with American accents, because <laughs> that's how we've seen it on TV. Like CSO. Yes. So, you know, there's like, mm, yeah. But I'd like to see a lot more, and, and, and it's a very small market. So in the States, they're actually making money, but we're just not seeing enough of it here yet. How's that mean? We've both got our hands yeah. up. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm wondering a little bit about the, the kind of um, transparency and authenticity you're talking about, with you know, especially the Sarah Koenig style, where she, you, know, you hear her doubts and you hear all of that as part of it. But then in that... Planet Money episode, and then there's a really um, there's an episode of Startup that does something similar, mm. where they take you inside, putting this podcast together, yes. and the scripting and the many mm. versions, like how many scripts it takes mm. to get you to a point where you sound spontaneous, and <laughs> you know all of that kind of thing. And so I guess I'm kind of wondering about the constructed nature, the constructed nature of that mm. authenticity and transparency, and where you know how much work goes in behind the scenes to get you to the point where you sound kind of off the cuff and conversational. And it seems to me that those those podcasts that put that work in and that, that are actually very highly produced yeah. oh, are yeah. the ones that are reaching not the chum casts that are, mm -hmm. have that those niche audiences. So there's kind of still a hell of a lot of journalism going on. Yeah, you know, to get you to that kind of off the cuff. Or and see, that's what I think is a really interesting point here. And and again, picking up on, on Tom's question. The, the, uh, the drive towards podcasting, if we can call it a revolution or whatever we want to call it, really it's come with journalism mm. in the States. Mm. These guys are all journalists. They define themselves as journalists. They're informed by their journalistic training and uh, as journalists for 20 years. And the artifact of radio, you know, the more it sounds like easy is off the cuff, mm -hmm. the more work's gone into it to make mm -hmm. it sound like mm -hmm. that. So nothing is just off the cuff. Mm. Um, 
And, and I think that's just really what we're not seeing in Australia. The, the experimentation that's happening here is not driven by journalists. So even the Radio National people, they're broadcasters. And that's kind of a union separation. Mm -hmm. It's part of the ABC. <laughs> it was all in different, um, what are they called, divisions. News were journalists, broadcasters were. So that's the historic and, and uh, industrial reasons, really. So that's a significant difference between these two uh, styles. Um, I'm interested in the evolution of This American Life. So This American Life started out as a radio program, mm. predominantly. Yes. And now is predominantly accessed as a podcast. Has that made any difference to the form of This American Life or to the type of content that it deals with? Has its character changed as a result of the way audiences tune into it? Not easily. As in, there hasn't been any studies done particularly looking at that so far. Uh, but I would say that from being a long-term listener, no, it's not easily... Uh, uh, Assessed actually in that way, so unleashed uh, swear words is about the only. Yeah, <laughs> I mean because because Ira Glass was the real driver for these personal types of storytelling, and he was such a presence in that. Uh, it's his baby in a way, but the spin-off has I think made it the other ones that have come informed by this American Life are even more conversational. Like his show has got something like 20 people working on one episode. So, and they go, they work for a very long time, so very high quality productions. Whereas some of these other ones, even though they're high production values, they would not work quite that amount of time into the production. So I think the format is still very set. It's got the three acts. They deal with, uh, you know, topical issues in a journalistic way. They do some fiction, although it's mostly non-fiction. So no, it hasn't, but it's inspired the experimentation that we're seeing elsewhere. So if there's been a revolution, Ira Glass is the revolutionary, is that <laughs> fair? Oh, he'd love to be called that, I I'm reckon. sure he would. But <laughs> it, it sounds like um, this was a wave, this is a wave that was partly created by him. Mm. I would say that that's true. I mean, I think he's had a very significant role in this. They started in 95, and it took them many years to reach a million uh, listeners. And then when it became available on podcasts, you know, millions of people accessed it. So it's kind of mainstreamed his style. And then people have taken that and gone even further in this conversational uh, way. Yeah. Um, kind of connected to, to music, so, so uh, at the moment a lot of music producers now will actually do a final master using a pair of microphone headphones as well as speakers because yes. most people will actually listen to it using their headphones. Um, and often they create two separate mixes, so one that mm. people will use in the dance club yeah, and it's right. a different mix than actually appears on the iTunes music store. Um, even the one on the CD is different to the one that appears on the music store right. sometimes. Um, I'm, I'm kind of interested in, in this idea of the sound, whether the sound for podcasts is designed for being in your ears more than listening mm. to it with, with speakers. Mm. Some of them are, and I and I would say so. Again, back at the ABC, we would mix uh, in a beautiful big multi-track room, very expensive, and yet you would mix and listen in this crappy little speaker because that's how most people would listen to it in the car. So you had to make sure that the levels were actually working in the car. But what I, I mean, I'm only seeing this in, in work that I'm reading about other studies that people are doing, is that there is an increasing interest in actually creating really stereophonic work because they know that they're going to be listened to in headphones and that people will come back to them and re-listen. So that's a big difference, just putting that time in and the va you know, really valuing the impact of sound, I think. But I haven't heard of people doing different mix. That's a very interesting idea, really. I just wonder, for something like yeah. cereal, for me, it sounded great on the headphones, and then in the car, it sounded weird, because someone was whispering right. to me from two metres away. Yeah, yeah, you're um, right. Um, so I, I that's really true, actually, yeah. yeah. I listened to some of it in headphones, and then I binge 
lessened driving up to New South Wales, and I kept having to adjust, and it drives me bonkers when I have to adjust. Yeah. Hmm. They, they all, um, those kind of podcast luminary types, the uh, Radio Lab and Serial and This American Life, so they all have, have really beautiful music, and uh, some of the hosts are composers and that kind of thing too. So in, I know you emphasise first-person storytelling in terms of intimacy, but I think the music scapes of them all is really key to that too. Yeah, I didn't even touch on that, and I completely yeah, yeah. agree. But yeah, but yeah. I was just kind of Central. bouncing off that, 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 mm. that that's a, yeah, a, a key part of the pleasure of listening to them, is mm. that is that's that true. music mix. I also think it's our voice, because I mean, it, it is the standout podcast, none of the others are anywhere near it mm. in terms of, you know, number of listeners. I think she has the acceptable American voice. You know, just like in the UK, you know, lots of finance and business correspondents are Scottish mm. because right. it's like the acceptable voice of finance <laughs> for some reason. Um, I think she's got that. I also remember in the UK that there was for years a voice that kept coming into voiceovers in um, adverts, and we, uh, in my house, we called it the voice of the Nasdaq because this guy had this lovely, soft, deep, velvety voice, and he obviously got tons of work everywhere. Because and he had that kind of American accent that that people like to listen to. That's that's it, you know it's not throwing you in strange to strange places or odd pickups. It's that kind of. And I think that Sarah Koenig has it. Mm. Iron Glass really doesn't. Really but he has a distinctly not radio yeah, voice. He does. That's right. Yeah, traditionally anyway. And they did a whole episode about whatever yeah. that vocal thing is. fry. Yeah. But do listen to Dan Box. I think he's a really it's from the Australian. So he hasn't got a trained radio voice, but what he does is really impressive, and he creates that that connection. And you just you become you become really kind of used to him. He becomes that friend, and he's very good at asking himself, "Is this really true?" He keeps questioning himself all the time. Is this right? Am I painting out this person to be a murderer? What if this person isn't a murderer? So that that I think. Yeah, I was very impressed by that, the way that he does it. I think we've gone over time. We have run out of time, unfortunately. It's been really fascinating. But please join me in thanking me once again. Thank you very much. And thank you for coming. Yes, thank you everyone for coming. And there'll be another forum in two weeks. Uh, yes. yes. What is it? Yep. What's the next one? The next one, um, I can't remember. <laughs> <laughs> it's giving me a topic. Yeah. <laughs>